Okay, uh, it's really great. Um, we had the pleasure and honor of hosting Mike when his team was uh, in D.C. for that roundtable, and Bill Von Villian was instrumental in that. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of where we are in the U.S. I'm, I'm probably going to be the contrarian. Uh, uh, you're always the contrarian in your own country. You know, everybody looks at you, oh my gosh, why can't we be like the U.S.? And like, I don't know that you want to be like the U.S. <laughs> Um, ITIF, think tank, nonpartisan, core mission is really thinking about innovation policy. Uh, although in the last probably three years, we've uh, written an extensive series, 10 reports or so, really about industrial strategy, what it should look like. We had one report on how the U.S. government should be organized to do industrial strategy. We had another about sort of the competitive position of the U.S., et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's my vision of the U.S. Um, you can buy that t-shirt if you want. Uh, uh, I don't care about jobs, I just want robots. Um, anyway, and all the uh, jokes. So, a couple of major points to make <clears throat> before I kick off. One, we're not at an industrial policy moment in the U.S. Everybody's like, oh, you're finally at an industrial policy moment. We're not, and I'll explain why. Second, um, we don't do policy. I was like, I was listening to Mike, I was going, what a bizarre world that is, because I don't, I don't recognize that world at all, Mike. You know, we make sausage, not policy. Um, we used to make policy, and Bill will know what I'm talking about. We used to make industrial innovation policy, and that was back in the 80s and early 90s when we faced the Japan challenge. We actually had a whole system set up. We had analysis, we had task forces, we had presidential commissions, we had a congressional body. Bill, you helped lead a lot of that work. Um, and we had a wide array of innovation policy initiatives that many now copy all around the world, the Bayh-Dole Act, SBIR, R&D tax credit. Those were all U.S. innovations. Nobody had those before this. Um, and, and we did it in part because we actually had analysis and policy making. Um, we by and large don't have that, uh, with the exception of a few places. I would put MIT on that list. MIT has done great work. A couple of think tanks have done good work. But by and large, we don't, we don't have it in government. You, know, you, you go to like, where in the U.S. government is the body that focuses on industrial innovation policy? You can't find it because it doesn't exist. The closest, perhaps, is in the Department of Defense. But it's very narrowly targeted uh, to, obviously, defense concerns. Um, so let me just quickly, what are the problems? U.S. manufacturing is very weak. Uh, the share of GDP, it's down 16%. Uh, uh, we run a $200 billion trade deficit in advanced technology products. Um, you won't really need to understand that, but basically what you can see is a lot of um, sectors have seen negative real value added growth. The only reason everybody in the U.S. is in this belief that U.S. manufacturing is doing well is because of what's called NAICS 334 computers, hedonic pricing. It makes it look like everything's great. In reality, 100% of the growth of U.S. manufacturing output was in NAICS 334. And it's all fake because it's all about hedonic pricing and, and Moore's Law. You take out that one sector and you see negative growth of U.S. manufacturing value added as GDP has grown over 20%. Um, this is a study we did last year, just quickly go over, uh, it's called the Hamilton Index on Advanced Industry. Um, we're updating it with 2020 data from the OECD, and now I'm going to include all like 70, 60 countries or so. But what you can see there is um, the vertical line, so, sorry, the, the vertical axis, the y-axis is the uh, essentially the location quotient or relative concentration uh, of the U.S. Uh, sectors, and then this way is how is the direction of change. And what you can see is really only two sectors have grown. Um, since 1995 uh, to 2018, and that's uh, information uh, services, com uh, cloud computing, software, et cetera, other transportation equipment, Boeing. Uh, but everybody else, uh, and you can see some of these sectors were just terrible at electrical equipment, motor vehicles, machinery and equipment. Um, so the picture is not a very good one for the U.S. Um, this is uh, where we are globally. You can see uh, the, the size of the bubble is just is, is the size of output. So obviously we're a huge economy. We have a, we have a big bubble. But when you look at specialization on all of these, and these are as I said, all those. And you see Taiwan leading, Korea, Germany, Japan, China's uh, a little bit ahead of us. Um, you take out Germany from the EU, um, 
not doing very well at all. Um, and then a few other countries. Okay, so that's uh, manufacturing productivity growth has actually been going down. Uh, never in our history has manufacturing productivity growth declined. Never ever happened before. And yet, you will not read a single article about this issue. There's nobody in government that's done an analysis of it. We've done an analysis of it, but it's like this thing just doesn't exist. Um, new study we just did, we la lag on robot adoption. This is robot adoption for manufacturing worker, or 10,000, whatever, um, as controlling for wage levels. So uh, low-wage countries should have lower robots. Uh, you can see China, you know, massive lead. Uh, China actually has more robots per manufacturing worker than the U.S. does right now, just on a regular basis. But when you control for wages, um, uh, terrible. U UK, if it was on here, would be close to last. And we, of course, run a massive trade deficit. Uh, I like to note the Europeans always talk about their digital trade deficit with us. We run a $200 billion trade deficit with Europe. Um, but this is a, we're, we account for over, of all the trade deficit countries in the world, we divide countries into trade deficit countries, trade surplus countries, we account for about 75% of the global trade deficit. So we just basically buy lots of stuff. And, and don't sell them much. Uh, China accounts for about 45% of the trade surplus, or 40%. All right, drivers of U.S. industrial policy. Uh, the single biggest driver is China. Uh, with, that's really what's changed in the U.S. over the last five years, or growing recognition that China, whether you can argue it's fair, unfair, whatever, I don't want to get into that argument here, but the recognition that China has a strategy to become globally global leaders in a whole set of advanced industries. When we had the free trade agreement with China, we thought the deal was low-wage country, specialize in low-wage, low-value-added industries. You can make all our toys for McDonald's Happy Meals. You can make all our furniture. You can make all our T-shirts. Um, but we'll do the real stuff. Um, and then Made in China 2025, plus all the other things that have happened, have woken up policymakers to say, wait a minute, they aren't happy with low value added, they want high value added, and that is directly at the core of who the US, economy, what the US economy is and how we think of ourselves. Um, and that goes to two things. One is the issue of dependency. Um, if we ever have a um, conflict with uh, China, uh, whether it's militarily or otherwise, uh, there's a real sense of who's going to be more dependent, who has more economic, techno-economic leverage. And right now, we have a little bit more, according to some study from Tsinghua University, but it's going in the wrong direction. So there's a big push in the U.S. to build up our capability so that we are not dependent and, ha and let the Chinese have leverage over us. Um, and the secondary is obviously dual-use technologies, where and semiconductors is the best example of that. Um, climate change uh, is, is a driver in equity. Uh, I like to joke uh, that uh, the cl Biden climate, Biden industrial policy is about basically two things, two words, green equity. Uh, it really is what a lot of it is about. It's not about this kind of thing that we're thinking about. Um, okay, a lot of this you know. Chips, um, the Chips Act, $49 billion for basically re relocation subsidies, uh, a 25% investment tax credit, and about $14 billion for R&D, uh, advanced R&D programs. Um, that was a defense bill, so just straight up. That would not pass if, if the Defense Department did not say, we have to have access to chips, and if Taiwan is invaded, we, we're going to be in a terrible position. That's why that bill passed. Because in the US, if you just said, if, for example, there's people now talking about a chips for biotech. There's no way that's going to pass because that would be industrial policy and, you know, we don't do industrial policy. The science component, uh, so these were basically, let, by the way, the other key thing to understand, this was not a Biden initiative. Biden takes credit for it, which of course you would. This was a legislative uh, congressional initiative, principally in the Senate and principally led by Senator Chuck Schumer, who's the Democratic, who's the, who's the majority leader, who's a Democrat. So they had this one thing called the Endless Frontier Act, and then they had ships. It was over here. They were on parallel paths. They put them all together in a legislative package. The, the science component of this, and this is, I, I think, pretty important, is, is we worked really closely with those folks. And the idea was to identify 10 strategic technologies, uh, like uh, quantum autonomous systems, uh, AI, biotech, et cetera, 
uh, and then give a boatload of money to NSF, National Science Foundation, but for slightly later TRL research, more focus on commercialization, more focus on working in <laughs> partnership with industry, uh, and that violates the entire ethos of NSF. NSF is, as I like to quip, is the National Scientist Foundation, uh, basically a bunch of PIs that want money uh, for whatever the PIs want to do. And so it was designed that way and it set up a special program in, in NSF called the Technology Innovation Program, TIP. Um, the problem is when it went through the sausage making of, of, of Congress, the House decided the Republicans in the House said, we don't want it to be too much involved in industry because that's industrial policy. And the Democratic part, the Democrats who have gone way left in the last five years said, we don't want it to go to industry because we hate industry. Uh, so they really watered this program down quite a bit. They made it more of a science program than a technology program. Um, that's kind of where we are. Regional innovation hubs. This is actually a really a cool idea because it was my idea, um, so it has to be good. Um, but this was a program that recognized that almost all of the really advanced innovation and job growth was in five metropolitan areas in the U.S., Silicon Valley, Boston, uh, Seattle, et cetera. And that there was this big regional gap in the heartland, if you will. So this is a program really un unusual in the sense of it basically, it, there's a competition now the Department of Commerce is leading. And it says uh, we're going to award uh, between 10 and 20 of these innovation hubs. They'll get five years funding for five years and possibly another five years. Um, great program. Unfortunately, NSF decided it has to have its own hub program, and they are not working together. And NSF will award hubs here, and Commerce will award hubs here. DOG just awarded a set of hubs. Um, it's not how you make sausage, but that's what's going on. Related manufacturing, we have a program called the Manufacturing Extension Partnership at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. It's basically extension services for SMEs. That got, I don't know, what was it, 40% increase bill, something like that, 50%. Better than nothing. Well, I'm getting to that. <laughs> um, and then um, uh, IRA, obviously. So IRA is an energy bill. It's just straight up. It's just energy. It was an energy, it wasn't industrial policy. It was industrial policy for energy, but it was really energy bill. And it's just basically largely massive tax subsidies. Uh, uh, chips, if you put all the chips money together, you're probably at 80, 90 billion. Uh, IRA is expected to be 400, 500 billion easily. Uh, and some people estimate it could be as much as a trillion. Um, and then lastly, by America, the Biden administration is very much uh, into making a lot of this federal spending, particularly on infrastructure, contingent on Buy America, although there are lots of waivers that are going to be involved in that. Okay, so politics. As I said, this was driven by the Senate, not by Biden. Uh, as I said, Democratic Science Committee really watered this down to make it science policy rather than technology policy. Um, what was unusual for the U.S. In our, in our politics is actually some Republicans actually signed on to this. So in the Senate, uh, which was, I guess, 51 Sen Democrats, 49 Republicans, you had 13 Republicans who signed on to that. And if you really needed 10 more votes, uh, you, we could have gotten 10 more Republicans. They just didn't need the votes, so people didn't do it. But why that's important is because Republicans for a long, long time in the U.S. rejected this whole idea. Um, but now there's a, there's a split within the Republican Party. Uh, one side are the more the traditional laissez-faire, uh, supply-side economics ideolog ideologues. And the other side, though, is more about, uh, if you will, national power, national greatness, competing with China, and willing to see the role of government uh, to, to really fix that. The last problem with this, uh, I would argue, is the Biden administration has, and I, don't, I say this, by the way, I was appointed to the Biden administration. I was appointed to Clinton. I was appointed to Obama. I don't say that. I don't say this as a, as a Republican, but I do think that the Biden administration has caused some significant problems because they've politicized the implementation of some of these programs. Uh, the Chips Act, for example, you have to build daycare centers. Um, first of all, whatever. But <laughs> the idea that companies, the HR people at these companies, are so stupid that they would go, you know what? Uh, 
uh, our workers need a daycare center, but we're not going to build one. I mean, it, these people know what they're doing. Um, you had to use union labor. That raises costs. You had to do, there's no stock buybacks. Well, I hate stock buybacks, and I'd love to have a national stock buyback law, but that was not the place to put them. So they were trying to accomplish a lot of their overall goals in this particular program. There were problems with that in terms of administration of the program, et cetera. The biggest problem, though, easily the biggest problem is if this ever comes around again, you will be lucky if you get five Republican votes this time because the Republicans feel burned. They're like, we took a big risk, we went out on a limb, and this is what you've done. You've politicized this by imposing your social policy on this goal. And I think it's a mistake that the administration made because of that. Um, so, as I said, we don't have an industrial policy. CHIPS was defense, science, component of CHIPS and science, science, IRA was energy. Not really what we think about when we think about kind of industrial strategy for advanced industry competitiveness. Um, challenges going forward. Number one, the reason we were able to do the 90, the, the, all this great stuff in the 80s is that the neoclassical empire was modest in power. It really has grown. And now the neoclassical economists who decry this stuff, they just write constant op-eds. The reason, by the way, some of this passed is they were asleep. I kept waiting for them to be and they just didn't really know what was going on in Congress. And then they woke up one day and they're like, holy jeez, how could this crappy stuff get passed? What were we doing? So now there's this long litany of op-eds and reports and all this stuff by lots of think tanks in Washington and all these neoclassical economists who say, this is terrible, you know, the market's going to get this right, we're going to screw up allocation efficiency. Those people aren't going away, unfortunately, and so uh, and now they, uh, we've awoken the beast, if you will. Uh, the second thing is, we're not going to do this again, so if you're worried about us trying to out-subsidize you, it's not going to happen again. This is a one-time thing, we were still drunk off of COVID spending, and so we're like, yeah, let's just keep spending money. Um, won't happen again. Uh, we, we're facing, uh, actually that should be higher, uh, 1 trillion, it should be 1.5 trillion uh, budget deficit this year. It's supposed to be 800 million and now it's CBO projected 1.5 trillion. We just don't have any more money. End of story. We do not have any more money. So everything we do in the future will be at the margin at best. Um, and then, as I said, we still have this big split, Republicans, free markets, Democrats, green equity. Um, that's not going away either. Uh, if you get Trump in office, he'll have an industrial policy for trade, but he won't have one for domestic. If you have a Democrat, probably more green equity stuff. Um, I, I should have added one more thing, by the way, and that's the uh, China pushback strategy. That's an area where we do have bipartisan consensus. Um, Everything from much tighter foreign direct investment review on Chinese investment into the U.S., as you, you probably have all read about the export control regime for uh, semiconductors and equipment. That's only going to get ramped up. I actually support almost all of that, uh, but that's only going to get ramped up more. That's, that is a one area we have total bipartisan consensus. So what do we need? Uh, we need analytical capabilities. So I've been looking for this spreadsheet for years, and I finally found it on the BLS website, which has 600, no, no probably 400 six-digit NAICS codes, manufacturing sectors, with productivity for every year from 1980 to 2021, or 22, productivity growth, amount of labor, labor costs, capital investment, all this amazing data. And nobody's ever analyzed that in the US. We simply are, nobody even cares about that. Uh, and so anyways, we're gonna do an analysis of it. It's fascinating data. Uh, how can we, you know, does wage, do wage levels co correlate to lag CapEx? Does CapEx correlate to lag productivity? Who knows what sectors are doing the most? We really don't have that, and we don't have any place in the federal government that has the capabilities. The Department of Commerce used to have those capabilities 20 years ago, but through just downsizing and they, they don't. Um, we need money, obviously. Um, we don't also have any analysis of the causes, with, the, with a few exceptions. Semiconductors is one area where we really analyzed causes. But why have we lost a lot of biomanufacturing production? I know why, I think, because we did a big study on it. But 
people don't really know. Why, are, why is our car production sector so weak? What's really going on there? Why are, why are business strategy decisions uh, uh, faulty? Nobody's doing that analysis in the US. Uh, it, it's unfortunate. So finally, I would say what we need is uh, an embrace of what we call national developmentalism. Um, really, the major doctrines competing in the US right now are sort of neoliberal economics, uh, uh, sort of left-wing populism, think think Bernie Sanders, uh, that's kind of the dominant strain in the, in the Democratic Party. Then you have kind of Trumpian nationalism, which is laissez-faire at home and, and sort of protectionism, or if you will, or aggressive trade policy abroad. But you don't really have a consensus around what, what we would call national development and using the state to drive uh, important national goals. So I will stop there. Uh, thank you so much.